Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 25th, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for uh, attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. And we're going to get to that when we get to the live charts. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep your questions relative to the slides. And then when I open it up for live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. And if there's not time to cover it, I'll cover it in a Q&A session, which are separate from these sessions. And I'll give you access to that if it's something that requires a lot of thought. Your favorite stock picks, again, if you don't mind, hold off until we get to the live charts. Ask about one ticker at a time. And this is for your benefit, just to make sure I cover all the stocks that you might be curious about or want to see what my two cents on. All right, what are we talking about? Well, probably need a better title for this, but the bottom line is there's two types of traders, those who truly want to be successful and those who think that they want to be successful. And that'll make a lot more sense in a few minutes. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or is all this summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that line from my friend Greg Morris. All right. There's two types of aspiring traders. Those who think that they want to be successful and those who truly want to be successful. Now you're probably thinking, well, doesn't everybody want to be successful? Well, after years and years of doing this and quite a few things that have happened to me in more recent times, which I'm sure I'll probably talk about, I don't know. Those who think that they want to be successful are willing to blow harder in cash in the markets, but not on themselves. And those who truly want to be successful are willing to invest in themselves. Now, I'm going to show you where the screen grab comes from. Under the holistic trader, under the process of becoming a successful trader, easy for me to say, I found this graphic. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because, as I just said, people are willing to throw money at the markets, a lot of money at the markets, thousands, but they're not willing to invest in themselves. And just to sort of prove the point, and there's other reasons too, but just to kind of prove the point, I made my books available completely for free lately. And I'm going to see how that goes for a while. And in the book, I know somewhere, or one of the books at least, I said, plan your trade, trade your plan, and explain and explain what that plan is. And just recently, I repurposed an article called Your Trading Checklist, which included an entry, a stop, an initial profit target, and a trailing stop. Now, this person is going to think I'm picking on them, but she's probably not here today because she's not willing to invest in herself. But recently, I mentioned a stock in the Facebook group, and she bought it willy-nilly. Now, I did stop out of this particular stock, and it didn't turn into the mother of all winners, and I did drop some F-bombs when it came back in, and I gave up some of those big open profits, which comes with the territory. It happens pronounced with a silent or spelled a silent SH, I should say. But after all was said and done, I forced myself to go back and look at it. I did the math and I made 3% overall on that trade. And that was over about a two week period. Well, 3% over a couple of weeks is much better than the poke in the eye. Now I have to be careful and not do that mentally monetizing or what would the a better word be annualizing that but in the back of my mind I, I did of course and annualize that's probably like a hundred and fifty percent or even much 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 more so this was one of the better trades in more recent times and lately I haven't had a lot of good trades truth be told and I feel good about it and I plan to trade and follow the plan not that I always do that every now and then something gets away from me but as a general statement I work hard to know where my entry is, where my stop is, my initial protective tar uh, profit target is, my initial profit target is, and how I'm going to trail that stop. Now, the reason I'm showing this, something as simple as that, obviously, and it's not just one person. I don't want this one person to think I'm picking on them because I see it all the time. 
It's like people email me all the time, freaking out. What, what, what do I do? What do I do? It's like, well, what was your plan going in? It's like, why didn't you invest in yourself to know how you were going to manage this trade going in instead of winging it? Now, the person who thinks that they want to be successful is constantly grail hunting. And I know I kind of beat the dead horse in the grail hunting, but we all tend to have to go through that process. I can help shorten your learning curve by telling you to find something simple first, and then if you feel like you need a grail hunt here and there, then go off and grail hunt a little bit. I've known traders before that are into all these arcane methods, but regardless of what all these arcane, meth arcane methods are saying, they actually follow the trend. They're just trend followers, and that grill hunting becomes somewhat of a hobby. So I, look in, I wouldn't recommend you do that, but if you had to grill hunt, find something that works that's really simple first, such as simplify trend following, and then maybe do a little grail hunting, and not just the opposite. Now, y'all, you guys have seen me do this trader's journey slide over and over where you go through the grail hunt and you increase indicators and then you start studying the aforementioned arcane and before you know it you get really really confused and then the true enlightenment comes when you start peeling off those indicators well if i can get you back to that blank chart and maybe just the occasional moving average and then ask yourself is it going up is it going down is it going sideways and if you need to use that moving average or maybe the boat side moving average just to give you a little feel if they're in proper order or if you have landry light meaning the lows are greater than the moving average you know that can help you to see what's actually going on in the chart as i often say an indicator is really not an indicator because it doesn't indicate anything it just helps to illustrate it anyway those who truly want to become successful eventually and i use the word eventually there because Again, we all have to go through this grail hunt, and sometimes it takes a lot longer with others. Sometimes they get stuck in that grail hunt for a long, long, long time, and it's very hard for them to climb out of that. But eventually, they'll settle upon something, those who become successful, that is, they'll settle upon something that's simple and fits their psyche and lifestyle. As I've said quite a bit, I have a doctor client, and years ago, he used to carry a laptop from exam room to exam room because he was day trading while he was making his rounds. Now, as somebody pointed out, the quite obvious, the captain obvious part of this little anecdote is that you're either going to be a really crappy doctor or a really crappy day trader, and you're probably going to be both, a crappy doctor and a crappy day trader, if you're trying to day trade and take care of patients. So he did come to the realization and he committed to some commitment devices, which we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Now, those who think that they want to be successful tend to do the same thing over and over and over, such as system hopping or fighting trends, and then they're expecting a different outcome. Now, Einstein once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And my story here would be getting married, okay? I The week before I met my wife, soon-to-be wife, I watched the Seinfeld where it was opposite George. Opposite George did everything the opposite. Well, George Costanza, I'm sure most of you guys have seen Seinfeld. Well, George Costanza wasn't doing well with women or his job or life or anything, because he was behaving in a certain manner, well, he decided to do just the opposite. Well, I said, you know what the heck with it? I'm going to do just the opposite. So I met this really pretty girl, and the old me would have sat there like a puppy dog, <laughs> talked to her all night. But the new opposite me says, eh, let me just talk to her a little bit. I'm going to walk off, pretend that I lost interest, and then I'll come back, and then try not to puppy dog too much. Well, by the end of the night, we ended up having a date set, and she had some things going on. But then after that, we were able to have a date. Now, my car had blown up. It didn't, didn't blow up like on fire, but the engine seized up. And I, all I had was my father was nice enough. He had given me a, an old work truck, which I used as a spare truck, and just to haul things back and forth to my boat at the time and things like that. So I had a, an old truck. So the old me was thinking, I'm going to go rent the most expensive car I can afford I'm going to take this girl to New Orleans. We're going to have a very expensive meal. 
to be romantic and blah, blah, blah. So instead, I did just the opposite. I took it to the Salt Bayou Lounge in my old beat-up pickup truck, which had a hole in the floorboard <laughs> on her side. They had to watch the puddles so she wouldn't get splashed. And the Salt Bayou Lounge is better known as the Chicken Drop. And I think Katrina washed it away. But the Chicken Drop, to those who've never been to a, a Chicken Drop, is where there's a bunch of squares on the floor. And you pay a dollar per chip for one of the squares. And they mix it all up to where you get a random square. And if the chicken poops in your square, you win 100 bucks. Well, even, even then I was thinking, well, what would I do with that 100 bucks if I won the 100 bucks? And said, no, 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 just stop being old Dave and just be this new opposite Dave. Well, turns out that was the last girl I dated. And within a couple of years, we were married. So you have to... Ask yourself, are you in the process of insanity by doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome? And I'm really amazed with people how long they will try something and keep trying it despite of not having positive results or, or in spite of not trying to improve themselves. Now, keep in mind that it does take some time and it, one of the hard things in this business, as I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes, is separating that insanity from persistency. If you are following a conceptually correct methodology, you just have to make sure you give it a lot of time and you have to constantly work to strive to get better. But those who truly want to become successful are willing to learn from their mistakes. Now, as I've, say, as I've said over and over again, they know what they're doing wrong and they create commitment devices to protect themselves from themselves. I did a whole presentation just on acrasia, and a big part of that focus was commitment devices. The aforementioned doctor, I know I've told the story a thousand times, but probably tell it a thousand more. He gives me so much good material. But the way he quit day trading was he moved his account or his trading account over to the wealth management side of his portfolio where he physically has to call in a trade if he wants to make a trade and not just click a couple of mouse clicks and trade like a madman all day. And quoting him, he says, well, this way, I don't want this woman on the other end of the line to think I'm a lunatic by making all of these trades. So that's a commitment device. That's a physical commitment device. Uh, an easier one would be just turn your screens off, try to reduce your observations without going off too much on a tangent. The more observations you make, the more likely you put yourself in a state of regret because more often than not, positions tend to move against you. There's a lot of backing and filling, even on really, really good positions. Now, those who think that they want to be successful are constantly joining the church of what's happening now. And occasionally they hit upon something that gives them false hope. Now, as a trend follower, I do occasionally join the church of what's having, happening now, but I use my methodology within that. So within Bitcoin, a couple of years ago, you guys saw me talking a lot about Bitcoin and Bitcoin trade and Bitcoin bubble. But what was I doing? Well, I was playing the pullbacks, scaling out, adding to positions by swing trading around the core position and all the things that I preach every week in these presentations and throughout the learning management system. And you haven't heard me talk about Bitcoin for a while in the last couple of now columns, if you look at my website, what am I doing? Well, I'm trading Bitcoin again because it's beginning to move. So it's okay to follow the hot markets. Just be careful if you find yourself chasing some sort of fad. Now, those who truly want to become successful can become distraught and usually that's right before a major breakthrough. And if you think about it, all the motivational people talk about this too. If you don't reach a point of frustration, you may never get out of that lull that you're in. If you don't reach a point of complete frustration and want to get better, you never will get better. The thing you have to realize is, is you're often a lot closer than you think you are to success. I often tell a story of the African Queen, which is a movie from, geez, I don't know, 60 years ago, maybe? I don't remember when it was. 
but it was set in post World War One, and they were trying to get it was a Catherine Hepburn and Bogey. They were trying to get down a river. This is the actual boat. I did a presentation years ago on this, and I flew down to Key Largo to get a picture of it. I spared no expense for this column. <laughs> and that's the, my official reason why I went there. Anyway, this is the actual boat. It looks a lot bigger in this picture. It's really pretty small. And they'll actually take you on a tour in it or putt-putt around or whatever. And I didn't reason we didn't go was the weather was really horrible when it seemed like a it seemed like a bit of a tourist trap and a waste of money. But that's the actual boat. And in the movie, as I wrote in the last column, they fought off leeches and they shot rapids and then the Germans shot at them and they had all the mosquitoes, they had all these trials and tribulations, and then they just give up trying to get down river to the lake. Well, when the camera pans back, they were about ten feet from the lake. It reminds me of Hills what is it, three feet from gold? I'm sure you probably know the story. I'll give you a Reader's Digest thumbnail real quick. The There was a guy decided that he wanted to strike it rich, so he bought a bunch of equipment, started digging for gold. He found a little bit of gold, which got him excited, but then the mine failed to produce any more gold. Well, if he had did a little bit more studying, he would have learned that a gold vein will sometimes curve around. So what happened was he just hit the beginning of the loop of the gold vein and he sold the equipment for pennies on the dollar. Whoever bought the equipment, I don't know how long it took them, but they went three more feet and he found the largest gold find in the United States, at least at the time. So it's kind of like that, the three feet from gold, African queen syndrome. Now, again, you have to be careful with the definition of insanity of doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. But if you are doing something that's conceptually correct and you're willing to work to get better and you do that through deliberate practice, and that's a whole complete presentation in and of itself. Read a lot of Malcolm Gladwell and the guys, the other guy's name is Anderson. Anderson's not quite as exciting as Malcolm Gladwell, but he does have a lot of good things to say on deliberate practice. And in a nutshell, deliberate practice is not just practicing, but practicing to get better. So every night when I'm looking at these thousands of charts, I'm working to get better at what I'm doing. Recently, I started experimenting with ThinViz, and, and some of this is due to my physical problems I've been having lately with my hands and my elbows and, uh, and such. But I'm working on ways to have thousands of charts just scroll by me and I'm also looking at the thin viz because it shows me things that are a little bit different light than I would see it begging on my keyboard going through telechart which I'm now using slideshows there but I digress anyway the point I'm trying to make is every day when I do my analysis I'm trying to get better at getting better and I carefully look at any stock that makes a big move and I ask myself could I have caught the move? Should I have caught the move? And if I can honestly say, no, my patterns would have caught it, or yes, I do remember when that set up, but I decided not to take it for these particular reasons, then I have to walk away and be okay. But you have to work to get better. And again, I think a lot of times you're closer than you think. And a lot of times there's a key little piece that's missing, but you don't know what you don't know. And that's why I spent a lot of time in learning management system. Also, the reason I spent a lot of time in learning management system was because so many people just wing it. And I can't go back to that definition of insanity and trying to help every single person. No, go back and plan your trade. No, go back and, and trade your plan ahead of time. Do all this ahead of time and then just follow your plan and then Okay, well, go back and read this. Oh, you didn't read this? No, please go back and read that. It's like, no, if you want to help yourself, go through the learning management system. Or if you are you want to start off free, read the three books for free and then start looking at charts, start looking at a lot of charts, play devil's advocate, look for places where it works, but also look for places where it flat out just doesn't work. Now, the 
other thing with the learning management system is I'm able to go in and look and see, and so are you, if you're not following your money and position management plan properly and you haven't even completed the course or even started the course, then we both know where you might need to do a little work. My ultimate goal with all this is to rise to a level, to have you rise to a level, I should say, where we have a mastermind group. And I think the Facebook group is a bit of that or getting to evolve into that now because I've already picked up quite a few trades from you guys. Thank you, by the way, especially in areas such as IPOs. And so I think I think we're, get, we're getting there maybe faster than I'd hoped. And I think my ultimate goal would be get everybody through the learning management system. Let's fill in the missing pieces through the Q&A. And then let's all talk about trading in the Facebook group and let's all make some money. So that's kind of the ultimate goal where I'm going with all this. Now, those who think they want to be successful, they occasionally get sucked in by a get-rich-quick guru. I'm letting these guys get to me a little bit more than I should. I need to just move on. My wife said something so damn funny yesterday. It was a quote from Hangover, but I can't, I can't repeat it. Maybe, maybe it's a two-drink minimum, but it was damn funny. But anyways, these guys are putting a lot of noise into the system, into the system, making it look a lot easier than it really is. And, and the problem is every now and then, occasionally, somebody might hit it just right with one of these guys and make a little money. But unfortunately, that's probably the most expensive trade they'll ever make because the rest of it is a lot of pump and dump. The people that advertise, and I, need to, I think my advertising revenues have gone down on YouTube because I basically in my videos are saying like, hey, those guys that are buying up my YouTube videos are the guys you got to watch out for. And it looks like I better quit doing that to demarket. I'm demarketing my own uh, videos. But, you know, I don't care. And, you know, like right now, like one guy's out there telling you that he's got this secret stock. Well, you mean to tell me that you've had these financial institutions worth billions of dollars and have all – have hundreds and thousands of people on staffs and hundreds of million dollars worth of computers and do all this analysis. And this one guy, you know, trading out of his basement or whatever, he has the secret, the secret stock. Okay. The next big thing, either he's long a boatload of this one particular issue and he's trying to pump and dump it onto you or he's delusional, but I digress. Now, those who think they want to be successful in their grill hunting and their guru hunting and all these other things, they throw stuff against the wall and hope something will stick. And every now and then, something does. Let's see, you know, throw the spaghetti against the wall. I guess it's a nice way of putting that and hoping that something will stick. While the problem is every now and then, something does stick. They do make a little money, but they're unable to separate the luck or being in the right place at the right time from a skill, and I'm gonna talk about that in just one second. Now, those who truly want to be com become successful, they, they'll they get there, but they have to hang in there. Like I just said, they could be a little closer or they often are a lot closer than they think they are, and they eventually get it. Now, those who eventually become enlightened, to sum all this up, they obviously learn, here's a dead horse, I'm gonna beat here, but they learn there is no holy grail, and then the gurus will come and go. Now, if you're watching this presentation, today is April 25th, 2019, at least when this original presentation is being recorded. And look out there, see who the biggest gurus are right now. And a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, see who the gurus are. I can go back a couple of years ago. There was a guru that I used to say he thinks he's Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know, and I haven't seen much of him in a while, so I wonder what happened to him. So the current batch that's out now, I'm sure in a couple of years, they will fade away. So just remember that and mark my words on this. And in some cases, without getting myself into a lot of trouble, but it seems like one out of a bunch of this, one out of the certain gang of gurus, I should say, looks like she's already had to prison. So. Not that I'm being shot on a Friday, but I'm thinking it's it's a karma thing. You can't continue to fleece people without any repercussions. Anyway, let's get back to making money. 
Now, those who really want to become enlightened learn that they will never get it exactly right and embrace the imperfection. I'm still working on trying to embrace the imperfection. I'm still working on not dropping F-bombs. I'm still working on being excited that I made 3% on a trade on my overall account over a couple of weeks, okay? And instead, I'm, I'm dropping F-bombs and I'm pissed off because I didn't make more. But you know what? I followed the plan. And that's what the plan said to do. And I'm not in there just to make a little bit of money. I'm in there to catch a longer term trend and make a lot of money. So that's something hard for me to wrap my head around personally. It's not going to exactly right. I, as I've said quite a bit, I took a personality test. I think it was Larry Williamson wrote a book. And I don't have it handy. I don't know the name of it, but. Anyway, it was Larry Williamson who wrote the book about trading psychology, or on trading psychology, I should say. One of the things he recommended was take a personality test. So I took one. It's the, I forget which one it is, the big three or something. And I scored miserably low in agreeableness, which means that I expect people to agree with me. I told this to my wife and kids. And they looked at me like I pooed in my pants. <laughs> so it's something I have to deal with. And that's not a very good trait to have when it comes to trading. By the way, take a personality test. You're going to be surprised. It's going to, it's going to nourish something, okay? And that something might be one of your problems when it comes to trading. Now, again, you have to learn that you will never get it exactly right. And I didn't get it exactly right. I made 3%, but I was far from getting it right. I did not catch the top in that market. Nor was I trying. And you have to just kind of embrace that and embrace that imperfect method. And all methods are, by the way. Those who do become enlightened realize that or come to the realization that trading done properly cannot, can often be boring. I tell you, a while back, I'm like, what am I going to talk about today? And we can charge. I'm like, well, I'm going to talk about patience because patience is important. And then I start going through some old slides and I'm like, well, wait a minute. I talked about that last year last month and wait that was the prior week's presentation so i can't beat the dead horse enough on patience and right now today i came in like i'm gonna talk about patience why because i can't find the setup to save my life and that's the market saying dave sit back relax let the market come to you very hard to trade pullbacks when the market is a overbought in other words hasn't pulled back and it's hitting new highs but that's just part of the system. I think if you can learn how to be patient, I think you'll be incredibly successful. And I try to make things happen quite often. And I love that the quote, I've, I've quoted this so much, people start to quote me as, say, as coming up with it. It's not me, it's market wizards. But in that book, they, they said you have to learn the distance between, the difference between intuition and intuition. And Guilty as charged. I do a lot of intuition, say, well, this little gap is kind of small. I'm going to go ahead and play this over the gap reversal, even though the gap's kind of small, because I need to pay for a new refrigerator, which evidently a refrigerator costs $10,000. I had no idea. Anyway, now here's the biggie. And I think if we had to just look at one particular thing, especially for someone who has some experience in the market. And Annie Duke wrote about this, and it's a great book, and I recommend you read it. If you go to daveleonard.com slash books dash two dash read, and her book is Thinking of Bets. If you if you buy it off my website, I think I'll make 25 cents, but that's 25 cents I could throw back into the website, so please do that. And I was a little disappointed because it it I was expecting this big, huge revelation in the book and basically it just turned out to be a little common sense and but that's okay it got me thinking a lot about process versus outcome biases terence odin once said outcomes I'm paraphrasing at least outcomes or noisy markets generate a lot of data and bad decisions can lead to good outcomes and good decisions can lead to bad outcomes. Well, Annie Duke's point is the poker player who plays a proper process will be successful in the long run. 
and they have to be careful not to confuse a winning hand and a bad process. You have to learn how to separate luck from skill, and that's not very easy. But if there is a secret to trading, I'm always like, there's no secret to trading. And then I say, the secret to trading is, it is following the process. Now, provided, of course, you spend enough time going through the charts to recognize that you do have something special, and you have seen it through good times and bad times, then reward yourself for following the process and not the eventual outcome. Now, those who do become enlightened, they're willing to be wise, W-I-S-E, while waiting on the wise, W-H-Y-S. So a lot of times you get into the market because you have a setup and you don't know why the stock is going up or whatever, I mean, other than your setup. But many times people will ask me, why is the market going up? I don't know. I don't know. But the wise thing to do would be just follow it, okay? Even though you don't feel very smart sometimes following the market, the wise thing to do is to follow your system. The wise thing to do is to follow the process. And eventually those become the wise, W-H-Y-S. As I've mentioned quite a bit, I'm now in a rental house, but a few months ago I was selling my house. And when people found out what I did, if I was at home working, you know, all these monitors everywhere and soundproofing and, and studio and everything, like, what the hell does this guy do, you know? And they immediately started asking me why the market is going up. Why is the market going down? It's like, I don't know. I just follow along. And they didn't seem very impressed with that answer. Now, at the risk of beating a dead horse, the enlightened and the successful traders and those who become successful, they do what? They plan their trade and they trade their plan. Easier said than done, but at the least, at the at at the least, you can plan your trade. Because was it Montier said, information is or stress is at its highest when information is changing or unknown. When is information changing or unknown? When the market is open. So as I preach ad nauseum, I think I even wrote it in the last column. At the end of the day, I like to grab a big cup of coffee and go through a few thousand charts. For me, it's like being on a treasure hunt. That's actually relaxing for me. I enjoy that. I know you probably think I want to party with this guy. But you could do that when stress is low. And if you can come up with a trading plan and follow that plan to the best of your ability, then you'll do just fine. Some months ago, I caught the end of a discussion on the 10% system. Have not been able to find it. Can you give me a lead or discuss? Thanks, William. Yeah, William, if you go to my website, if you go to daylander.com and you click on members, and right here it says free stuff, you'll see that right here, market timing mini course, okay? Now, if you don't have a log on, come down here. Well, it's not going to show because I'm logged in as admin. But at the bottom of the page, I'll be a sign up. So sign up for the free area, and then the course is free. And if you're already in, if you already are a member, I don't have everybody to memorize. So I don't know, William, I don't know if you're already a member or not. But if, if you already are a member, if you go to Dave Landry Members, and you go to the courses, and then it'll be under methodology. And let's see if I can find it for you real quick. And there's a little bit more to it under methodology, but the basics, or the basis of it is there. Methodology right here. Looks like I got to take some courses on it. And let's see, market timing right here under methodology, and then right here. Now, what I before you get to a specific system like this, I'd encourage you to go through the entire learning management system. And if you are here, you, I force you to go through it anyway. And right here, I talk about in, using indicators and things like that. And then right here, TFM 10% system. And I want to kind of give you my designers or author's intent, so to speak. So that's the introduction here. And then talk about rules and stress testing and then observations. Okay. Hopefully that uh, helps you out there. Bridgie said Finviz is a good scanning tool. Yeah, I'm actually an affiliate for Finviz now. So if you do decide to check it out, please use my link. I think that's going to be on my website. If you go to the homepage and you go to, you're welcome, William. 
and let me know if you have any questions and we'll cover the questions if my carpal tunnel doesn't allow i'll any questions you may have i will put them in, into the q a session the next q a session on that so if you go here by the way this is this is where all the links are this main button on the home page and if the free books go away here's another way to get the free book right here which is the link on my home page and then if you scroll down somewhere in here i have the finviz thing i think i might officially start promoting finviz because i think it's pretty good i think it's worthwhile and i have a variety of tools i use metastock for certain things i'm an affiliate for them i use tc a lot as you'll see today and in more recent times, I'm starting to use Finviz more and more. I've used Finviz for years, but it's been just in a few little uh, select areas. But now that I have a full-blown account, I'm finding it quite useful. And it might actually work nicely with my carpal tunnel issues, too. Okay, let's take a look at the overall market. You guys want to start asking about questions, feel free to do so now. Let's see if we can get this a little bigger in here. So I'm glad you brought up that 10% thing because that's one thing I wanted to cover today. For S and G's, when, I actually woke up thinking about that too. I know the things you wake up. <laughs> Years ago when I was dating my wife, she had a two-year-old and we had a party for her. And uh, we were playing musical chairs. And this buddy of mine, he's kind of dopey. He's like, Dave, your parties have changed. <laughs> So it's kind of like, that's kind of like a, an ongoing inside joke. My wife and I was like, Dave, would you wake up in the morning thinking about has changed? Okay, S&P 500 had a little dip this morning, but look at that. It's already recovering fairly nicely. Let's take a look at the spiders and see what happened. And you can see a little, uh, little dip and then already back in the plus comp. So that's really good. We don't want to focus too much on the micro, but obviously you have to start somewhere, okay? My big concern with the S&P, as I've been saying, ad nauseum remains the fact that we've had this v-shaped recovery at a high level and yes it's a good thing that a market recovers i'm glad it recovered a lot of people don't short so that's one thing that makes me feel better when the market goes up i know that people or or buying them or um i'm just, Hang on, I'm trying to multi-process, which they've proven you cannot do, by the way. But I know that people are, are trading alongside and doing well when the market goes up. When it goes down, I know a lot of them are throwing caution to the wind and holding on. And I know a lot of them don't short. My big problem is you have a big sell-off like this, and then the market comes all the way back up. Okay. Now let's measure that move and it's going to be ridiculous i was kind of shocked at how big that move was but let's just get a rough measurement on this and see what it is oops wrong one sorry okay so that was a was a 20 percent drop now let's take a look at from the low on up okay about 25 percent. i think it's 30 percent of nasdaq so it went 25 percent from late december to now so that's what's that uh four months and change almost five months well obviously a market doesn't do that in a year in fact the market did that a complete year that would be like a huge success so that's a long ways over a short period of time the market is very overbought and in the back of your head, not that you want to trade off of this, and that's one thing you have to wrap your head around, what's kind of fun to know or fun to talk about, fun to think about, and what can you actually trade off of? And one of those things is the what's the psychology of the market, and is it actionable? Well, it's not actionable, but what I'm wondering is everyone who did not – bail out when the market slid, if this market begins to slide again, if they're still jittery, or they could all rush to the door at the same time. So that's kind of in the back of my head. The other thing to remember, just something to throw out here from a little bit of experience, 
is the one reason you can't use just a pure classical technical analysis is because, and why is my minus key not working? Let's see. My well, minus key isn't working, but usually you can get like a, Oh, there it is. So getting back to just a generic technical analysis, classic technical analysis, Schaubacher, Edwards and McGee and things like that, they talk about a double top. Well, double top is when market goes up, hits a peak, sells off, and then hits that peak again, but then the second time it gets rejected. Well, you have to remember with something like a double top, double top sometimes there's it does a variation of things okay so sometimes oops sometimes it'll go up and hit the double top and then rarely does it stall right at it either stalls short of the double top or it overshoots a double top and then begins to sell off so from a psychological standpoint that would trap the most people on the wrong side of the market now again you can't necessarily trade directly off of big picture technical analysis you can't necessarily trade on what might be happening or what you think could happen psychologically, but you can continue to trade the patterns. You can honor your stops on positions and things like that. All right, let's fix this. Okay, yeah, keep the stock picks coming. I'm gonna keep, uh, well, I promise to stop pontificating so much. Anyway, so that's the big concern in S&P 500, V-shaped recovery at high level. Let's take a look at cash. That we can get there. Why is this thing not working today? Oh, you know what? I know what's wrong. My dragon is still on. So it's been listening to me. So there's the peas. Or cash, I should say. So we've had quite the recovery. Not that we can't keep going higher, but just realize that it's kind of like the old adage you know it's hard to run a race right after you ran a race so that's the problem with the piece same sort of pattern in nasdaq but as a trend guy i'm not going to argue with all-time highs in fact today let's see if we have an outside day sort of if we close above the open i would consider that a big success but you can see we did have a little bit of a opening gap reverse in the nasdaq but then it's already reversed and it's well off of those levels. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. Now the Rusty's off its worst levels, but still down three quarters of a percent nonetheless. My big concern here remains, as I've been saying, a nausea. I mean, it looks like a big picture retrace rally, thrust, pull back, and then so far hasn't gotten past this prior little peak in here. So I would feel a hell of a lot better about the Russell and the overall market for that matter, if the Rusty could get past these recent little peaks. As usual, one day at a time. Now, energy's got hit in here fairly hard recently. Let's go back to a daily. You can see it was, I guess, yesterday they got hit hard, and so did the metals. And that might be because the dollar broke out decisively in here. And remember, those commodities are dollar denominated. Now, keep in mind that intermarket technical analysis isn't always a perfect negative correlation like this or a positive correlation, whatever the case. Sometimes it's long lead and lag times, but sometimes it's a direct correlation. So I would encourage you to learn about intermarket technical analysis, but just be warned that it only matters when it matters. Many, many years ago, in fact, I actually read a book about a guy who did just that. You could trade the S&P off of bonds and vice versa if you wanted to look at it the other way around, but you can no longer do that. It only matters when it matters. I don't know why that is, but it's certainly something good to know. And when, those, when there is a direct positive or direct negative correlation, it's good to recognize those things. As far as the other sectors in here, most are looking pretty good with the big exception of the drugs. And most anything drug related, let's throw a bow tie in. You can see we have a bow tie down. That's not a good thing, especially off of all time high, especially off a of double top. I just got through telling you the double tops often aren't perfect. So far, that's a perfect double top, as you can see. 
Now, health services stalled way short of their prior highs, beginning to break down in here. Med instruments and anything pretty much health related. These are subsectors under health services. There's your perfect double top there. Maybe it overshot a little bit. Nice little bow tie down, nice little pullback. So these areas look like they could be a lot of trouble. I'm starting to see some short setting up. Haven't decided. Well, so far I've decided not to take them. Why? Well, the overall market's still doing pretty good in here. A lot of these setups have a lot of support below. So, and plus short's kind of a pain in the butt. It's, it's hard to make a lot of money on short side, but I'm paying attention. And if that's the only thing I could find is shorts, then I might start shorting these individual issues. Way back in 2007, I couldn't find a long to save my life, even though the market was not far off of all time highs. I apologize to my clients because I was recommending shorts. I must have looked like a madman, but the market had lost steam and the database was producing a lot of shorts. And that's the beauty of looking at a lot of stocks is sometimes things begin to deteriorate internally long before you see it in the major indices. But getting back to the positive, just kind of throw a dart pretty much every other sector with a few exceptions, but retail just off of all time highs, kind of double top looking, but hey, at, at new highs. Nonetheless, semiconductors doing really well, just off of all-time highs. A tiny bit of a knockout move there today, but looking pretty good so far. Nice little uptrend remains intact. And then as you go, again, as you go through these, most look pretty good. Uh, software or anything hardware, software, hardware, or technology-related, doing pretty good in here. You can see software, brand new highs. That looks pretty darn good. Some areas like the financials I've been a little concerned about because they still haven't broken through. This overhead supply in here, banks will be another area, especially the back to chart. If you back the chart way out, still looks somewhat questionable in here. So all isn't great in the world, but as a general statement, things are doing pretty good. Okay, what is a pullback goal in a stock like TW, close high bar? Okay. I've been watching TW, and maybe I'm looking for too much perfection. But I'd actually like to see this stock pull back a little bit more deeply. But you certainly can't do anything wrong. I mean, let me rewind that. That doesn't sound too. There's certainly nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is a pullback. Let's get on it, especially because it's an IPO. So what is a pullback goal in a stock like TW? Close or high of the highest bar? Okay, uh, I, I see your point. In the, let's put in the moving average so I can show you what he's saying. I have a little, and it's under methodology, I have a little IPO system or setup where you say, okay, if the close is above the five-day moving average, I'm sorry, if the low is above the five-day moving average and the close is a new closing high with some caveats, then you would go long on the close. So let's take a look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So on that system, you would have gone long at 42, okay? And so that's, so what he's saying is, are we playing it as a breakout or are we playing it as a pullback? Well, you're playing it as a pullback now. I just would prefer to it have pulled back more. The on-close systems such as the, I don't even have a name for that system yet. I need to put the word Landry in it, according to my wife. Put my name on some things like John Pass, John Bolger, that is. But, yeah, I'd like a little bit deeper pullback, but I hear you. I mean, playing as a pullback, which is kind of interesting. You would be entering right around the new highs anyway if you're using a liberal entry. So new closing highs, so it probably doesn't matter how you play that one. But, again, I just, God, I just wish it would pull back a little bit further. I've been looking at this one every day going, you could do it. Pump. This one looks pretty good. Um, first thing stands out to me is that it could use a little bit more pullback. And the other thing I want to do here, I want to take a look at it longer term. Yeah, it looks pretty good longer term. I think it's up in clear air. Yeah, brand new clear air. So, yeah, um, that looks fantastic. It did double over a relatively short period of time. So what I would do in this particular case is I would like to see more of a knockout type of move. 
technically that is a trend knockout, but I would prefer if this knockout was much bigger and then now it's becoming a pullback. So I'd almost like to see it maybe pull back to 22 or even lower before going after it. But certainly you certainly want to put that in your momentum list. And one obvious reason is that the persistency is just absolutely beautiful in this particular chart. So good job on that one, Donald. Thanks for coming today too. All right, CHKP, reversal gap strategy as a short. Again, not hugely excited about shorting at this juncture, but I hear you. Well, this is a pretty big gap. When you have such an extreme gap, I find that the chart gets kind of messed up. People kind of end up jockeying for position, and it's hard to trade. It, it stocks kind of get choppy afterwards. And so go in and study a lot of gaps, and you'll see the stocks just kind of chop around afterwards. Now, what's an extreme gap? Well, it depends. In this particular case, the stock gap down over 10 points, or roughly 10 points. And notice the HV is only 24. 24 HV is pretty low. HV is a relative type of, of measurements. Let's take a look at the spiders. Well, spiders are kind of low right now. They're at nine. But a lot of the wild and crazy stocks that we trade have HV in the 50, 60, 80 range, and sometimes even more. So this isn't that volatile stock. So a gap that big is maybe too big for the strategy. The strategy he's referred to is Sometimes you get a gap right off of highs, and you look to play that first little pullback. So your entry would have been somewhere in here. But in this particular case, the gap was too big. But, yeah, that does look like a stock that is in trouble. Voight, that's another one I've been watching, V-I-O-T. Looks good. It's had a pretty good run. Look at the HV on that, 93. Volumes, eh, a little bit on the low, 150,000 shares round numbers. Not too bad but a little bit on the low side. It's a relatively new issue, okay? It's had quite the run in here, but it's okay. And it's it's had two wide range bars up with most of the trend. Usually I like to see a little bit more breakout than just one or two big wide range bars. Let's see what happens when it pulls back a little bit more, maybe 12 and a half or not too far. You don't want to pull it all the way back to this prior breakout, but definitely put that one on your watch list for sure. Exog. This is an energy stock and it has plenty of volume, so it could be worth trading. The thing I like about trading a commodity related stock is when they go down and make these all time lows and base out for a, lot, for a long time. I, ideally, I'd like to see this base like six months before taking off. So I think it looks pretty good. It's no longer set up though. So for me to go after this, it would have to break out to marginal new highs and then pull back. It does have a little gap and some bad memories to deal with, but that's not too bad. I guess if it got up to nine bucks a share, you'd be in pretty good shape. But for me to go after this, what I'd prefer to see a little bit higher and then a pullback. I'm sure it's a bow tie too, sort of. It's a little sloppy on the bow tie, but you can see it did sort of bottom out in here. T-U-F, T-U-F-N, T-U-F-N, and Frenchie, you're next. Well, I do have some early or pioneer type of setups that I like to trade in these IPOs. And this one's only been public for what? Two weeks? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. By the way, I went through FinViz last week and showed how to uh, pull out IPOs or two weeks ago in the Q&A. So if you want to create watch lists, there's another way to do it in, in, in uh, TC, which I also showed in the Q&A. So you can get that in the Q&A sessions. Um, I don't think I would buy a new closing high on this one. The range is okay. I just prefer to see a little bit more range with a new closing high type of system, okay? Technically, you would have been long, I think on, not on that day, on this day here, I guess. The moving averages, I wish they'd plot a little bit earlier. The whole reason I put in, I created this little moving average system for IPOs was to keep you from trading them or have a have a 
a fixed way of avoiding them unless they've been trading for at least five days. It looks like IntelliChart, one, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't come in perfectly on that six day. You kind of have to project it down a little bit. But based on that system and based on this wide range bar, you would have been long on this particular day here. The range just isn't really enough for me to go after a pioneer type of setup in the IPOs. We were talking about KLDO, and I actually have it on another watch screen and keep an eye on it. But here's a case where it's only 13 to 15. I know that's a pretty good range, but it just seems like I'd like a little bit bigger range. And now the volume is pretty low on this one, so I'm going to probably take it off my screen because of the volume. But it makes a good point about range. Even though this looks like a pretty wide range, it's only about two points range. I know, percentage-wise, that's pretty big, but I just would like to see a little bit more range. TIGR was the big trade I was alluding to earlier. And you can see this particular case, the range was much better from here. And I think the buy was on this particular day here. Let's see. Well, you're not, I'm not going to get a good measurement, but that's quite a bit. That's like a 40% range, okay? It doesn't look like a lot, but it was. And then, as you can see, it shot higher before it began to fail miserably. And no, it's no longer set up just because it broke all the way out and came all the way back in. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Dave, why didn't you lock in this huge gain? And I asked myself that. And I made the mistake of telling my wife how much it was up. <laughs> and I'm going to say, oh, honey, um, remember that new refrigerator? We're going to have to buy a cheaper model now. Anyway, now the reason I hung on was because I was, A, following the process. I know easy said than done. And B, I wasn't looking for a four-point gain. I was looking for a 40-point gain. In other words, I was looking for a big trend to ensue, and that's on every trade. I'm looking to get a swing trade out and then stick with it for hopefully a longer term trend. Toughen, did we do that one? I don't remember, Donald. Hang on. Yeah, we just talked about that one. Brain fart. Now, pins. Pins is another one of those well-hyped IPOs. Range is a little tight on that one. One, two, three, four, five. Today is day five. Ah, it's going to be tricky. I'm watching it, okay? Uh, I prefer if the range was just a little bit bigger. And at this juncture, I don't know. I'd like to see a little bit more room on that, just a little bit more excitement, but this one's kind of on the cusp, and I don't want to get sucked into it just because it's it's a well-hyped IPO, but I do find it interesting, James. I'm glad you brought it up, but yeah, it's definitely on a watch list. It will, at the close of today, and provided it's anything above, let's just say 27, trigger an entry for a five-day entry type of setup. I just wish we had a little bit more range. I almost wish it would have maybe pulled back down below its IPO price and then went up and made new highs again or maybe just had some interspersed trading in between. But, yeah, good eye on that one. Um, let's take another look at it at the close and see how well it can close and what the range is on that. What's uh, 5 divided by, let's just say... Round numbers 23. It's a 20% range. I just like to see a little bit, a little bit more. Let's take a look at that Tigger real quick, just to kind of give you an idea of what I'd like to see. I have a window I can't find. And any more? Because we'll uh, we'll wrap things up here in a few minutes. If not. Okay, so in Tigger, the low was what? 807. And then one, two, three, four, five. The high was 1268. So that was a 57% range. That's pretty big. And I know it's a little scary with these buy on close setups. 
but if you look at just the chart, it doesn't look that huge. Whereas the pins were only about 20%. I, I think that pins is on the cusp. It's going to be hard. It's probably hard not to jump in on that one. Okay. But yeah, thanks for bringing that one up. Good, good eye on that. All right, any more? While we're in impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule. Anything on the answer will either be handled in the next week in charts, unless I can give you a quick answer through Dragon, naturally speaking. But next week in charts or the next Q&A session, if it requires a lot of thought. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Everybody have a great weekend, and then hopefully see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.